Uh, so, have you ever been um, and seen a sign hanging in a uh, store that looks like this? That says, under new management, right? So we might not, if you see that, we might not know what happened in a boardroom, we might not know, happen, know what happens in a lawyer's office, uh, but the banner like this will tell you one thing, things are different, right? Things have changed, there might be new procedures, there might be new products, there might be new business practices, might be a completely new renovation of everything about the company. But the point is to improve uh, the effectiveness and to improve the operation of the whole business. And so, you know what? When it talk, we talk about ourselves, it's pretty much an accurate description of what happened to you when you became a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 6 tells us that you were bought with a price. And in economic terms, what that really means is that once you became a follower of Jesus, he holds the title deed to your life, right? You've given up yourself as owner. And has, as he is the new owner, he has the right to make the cha necessary changes in methods, in practices, in function, in appearance, and do a whole renovation of your whole life. So that everything now about you now reflects his purposes and his goals. And this year, so if you're new tonight, we're spending a year long look at uh, the life of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Mark. And so once we discover who he is and understand his power and his authority, we'll relinquish our position as owners of ourselves and take up the humble and grateful attitude of a servant uh, of all he has given to us and a steward of everything he's put into our hands. And so last time when we started out in chapter 1, uh, we saw a declaration of the identity of Jesus. And if you were here, you remember that Mark started off with verse 1, and his intent for the entire letter was to, to give us the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we talked about that a lot last time. We talked about that that's the theme, that's the title, that's the thesis statement over the entire book. So we have to remember that every, with every part, everything we read, that that is at the top. All of it is pointing us back to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we looked at what those words meant, and we looked at what uh, the, the first century believers who read that would understand when they said that. And then we looked at three witnesses to his identity in the first 11 verses, and that the prophets, prophets tell us that Jesus is Lord. And John the baptizer showed up, and he pointed toward Jesus as the powerful one, and then at his baptism, the Father and the Spirit joined together and said he's part of the Trinity, the Son of God. And now, as we move past those first 11 verses, Mark sweeps us right into this action-packed, bang, 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 uh, uh, visitation of all that Jesus is doing and his encounter with all these people and these things that happen to him right from the chapter 11, I mean, sorry, verse 11 of chapter 1, all the way until midway through chapter 2. And he's showing us the authority that Jesus has. And that Mark is actually giving us the physical accounts of Jesus demonstrating his divinity, his self as the Son of God. And we touched on the temptation of Jesus a little bit last time, but I want to pick up there and uh, talk about the, um, the two big areas where he has authority over, and then some things under each one of them. And the first one is, starting with uh, uh, that his uh, temptation in the wilderness, is that Christ's authority shows his authority over the spiritual realm, and we begin with Satan there. And it says that once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan, he was with the wild animals, and the angels attended uh, him. And so Mark doesn't spend practically any time at all uh, talking about uh, the, the details of the temptation in the wilderness like you get in uh, Luke and with, in Matthew, uh, he, but he does mention it, so it's important for us to understand what's going on here. And as I was thinking after last week, and I was thinking back through the Old Testament, and I could be wrong about this, but I couldn't come up with any other person or any other, you know, where Satan tempted them uh, uh, directly, face-to-face, -face, except for one in the Old Testament. And that's what the one we talked about last week, which is Adam and Eve, right? And we know, all know how that went. It didn't go very good. And the point of showing Jesus face-to-face uh, -face with the devil here is the same times we talked about a little bit last time. It's reminding us that our righteous king didn't fail where man failed. 
failed, right? He didn't get sucked into believing the lies of the enemy uh, where we and they fail. Jesus always succeeds. Um, and, and now this is the only time that Jesus faced and was tempted by Satan, but it's probably the only time, or at least the only recorded time, that he faced it toe-to-toe, eye-to-eye, right, face-to-face. And even when he's tired and hungry, even when he had wild animals all around him, that's the detail that Mark gives us that we don't get anywhere else, um, he stands firm. And a lot of people look at uh, the, the, the good versus evil, God versus Satan, as two equally matched foes. It's a lot of times you say, okay, we're kind of standing back here watching good versus evil, fighting it out, and we kind of don't know which one, one's going to win. And that's kind of an Eastern look at the way people look at good versus bad, bad that uh, good versus evil, that yin and yang, that they're, you know, we just going this way, seesawing back and forth. But that's not the picture the Bible gives us at all. Um, Satan's not winning. I don't care what's going on in the culture. I don't care what you see on the news or social media. Satan is not winning. The Bible tells us that he is a defeated foe. Yeah, flip, flip all the way over to the back of the last book of the Bible, the Revelation. That's exactly the picture that you get. That, um, you know, if you read the story of Armageddon that, that we see in science fiction movies and books and all this kind of stuff, this great big battle and everything. But if you read the actual account, there's not a lot of fighting. It's like the kings of the earth gathered to make war against God. Jesus shows up and then it's over. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of destruction, but there's not a lot of fighting because God. Jesus is all powerful. It's he's defeated. And now we don't need to forget that Satan is a real foe to us as believers now, but because uh, he is out there looking for one to destroy and, and prowling around like a lion, but he is defeated because the Bible says, Greater is he who is in me, that's Jesus, than he who is in the world. And so remember that the Satan is no match for our God. That's what we see right here in the temptation of Jesus. So that goes hand in hand. So he's uh, Christ's authority is over the spiritual realm with Satan and then over evil spirits. Mark 1, 21 is where we start this story. It says they went to Capernaum when the Sabbath came. Jesus went to the synagogue uh, and began to teach. And the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as teachers of the law. And just as a side here, Jesus had authority greater than any of the religious leaders. They were just interpreters of the law. He really is the, uh, the word of God, the living word of God. They have that authority because he was the word of God in the flesh. So verse 23 goes on. He said, just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by the, an evil spirit cried out. Notice that he's in the actual, this would be like a local church and not the big temple. He's hanging out there. And he says, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so look at what the evil spirit says here. He identifies him as Jesus of Nazareth. He knows where he is, where he's from, why he's here. He also acknowledges Jesus' power over them. He's like, have you come here? You have the power to destroy us. That's what you're going to do now because they know the end of the story, right? Uh, and he says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That is God in the flesh, the Messiah. He identifies them. And uh, <laughs> so, and notice when he said, what he, Jesus said to him, he said, be quiet. Jesus said sternly, come out of him. And the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. That is indicating involuntary submission of this evil spirit to Jesus. He says, come out. He doesn't have the power not to do what Jesus says. So he comes up, shakes the man violently, and screams. Now, imagine you were standing in the synagogue when this happened, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like you're just there for temple reading and all this kind of stuff. And this is a big display. This is, uh, you know, probably could get your attention, right? <laughs> I mean, this is because um, you, you can, you know, he's speaking out loud. He's identifying Jesus and saying all these things about him. And Jesus is speaking to him and saying, come out, right? And so... Uh, says now it does say in verse 27 that the people were amazed and with this authority and that he gives orders to evil spirits to come out and they obey him and so some people are drawn to him and amazed by this others we know later on we'll see that the teachers of the law they don't respond to him at all uh, they actually are 
pushed away from you, then even though you've seen something like this, you'd think it would get your attention. But it does say in verse 28, and I love these things when he puts in there, news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Like, no joke, right? <laughs> if you see that, that's going to spread like wildfire. They do not need social media or viral videos for this to spread because this is exciting. This is, you know, some amazing thing, and it just spread really, really quickly. So we have Jesus demonstrating his uh, authority over Satan, over evil spirits. So they're both spiritual realm. Also in the spiritual realm, we see uh, he has authority over sin. Jump forward to Mark chapter 2. We're going to take these out of order. We'll get, the, get to, to the others in a minute. But, you know, uh, so the next miracle here just touches on something that was really important about Jesus' authority here, and that's his power over sin. Uh, now, this story here could be easily a whole lesson unto itself. There's so much stuff in here. But we just have limited time, so we just have to jump to the point here because it's a really, you can talk about this some in your table discussion if you want to. But um, you might know this story if you grew up in church. This is uh, where the paralyzed man has the four friends. Uh, and verse 4 says that since they couldn't get to Jesus because everybody everybody's crowded into the house, uh, uh, because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat with the paralyzed man who was lying on down to him. And Jesus saw their faith and said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And so uh, here the teachers of the law then think to themselves, they say, uh, down, no, this is in their heads, so the teachers of the law are sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, this is a super awkward moment here because Jesus knows in the spirit what they're thinking, and then he answers out loud. Imagine that. You're thinking something, and somebody says, oh, by the way. I think that's really awkward. And he says, why are you thinking these things? And he says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. And so the answer to this question is, which is easier? Neither, right? <laughs> it's like they already have acknowledged that nobody can forgive sins but God. And I'm pretty sure if you ask them, they would say nobody but God can heal the man and tell him to get up and walk either. So it, uh, the answer is obvious. It takes the power of God to do both of them, right? <laughs> and so then he says, but so you know, may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. There's his authority and power. He said to the paralytic, I tell you to get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. So Jesus here turns to this man and does the physical healing uh, to show definitively that he also has the authority to do the spiritual healing. So thus he proves that he has the ability to forgive sin. And that's the conclusion to this whole interchange here is you walk away from this going, okay, he just demonstrated it's God. He's God, right? He, raised, he heals lame legs, and he forgives sin. So Jesus demonstrates his authority over these three spiritual realms, uh, the Satan, evil spirits, and sin. And then also in this section that we're looking at tonight, he proves his authority over the physical realm. And that uh, starts in verse 29 of chapter 1. So he proves his authority. His authority over sickness. And so as soon as they left the synagogue, so this is before the, the paralyzed man, so, but this is still a different Sabbath, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. So, uh, so, uh, so the word for fever there is burning. It's like fire. So she's really sick here. And since this is Sabbath, Sabbath, Saturday, Say, well, maybe this is the original Saturday Night Fever, right? <laughs> <laughs> no joke. <laughs> and so he went, and, and so he, they came to him, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, helped her up, and the fever left her. She began to wait on them. So the typical way, I looked up this, and this is so so weird. It's like when somebody had a fever like this or were sick like this, they had all this superstitious stuff that went around them to try to try to um, bring healing to them, and uh, Jewish records say that you had to get a, a knife that was made out of pure iron and you had to tie it to a thorn bush and you had to say these words over the top of it. That's supposed to bring healing. But so Jesus just pushes aside all that silly nonsense and he just goes and he grabs her hand and 
he uh, helps her up. But this is a little uh, other thing to notice here in the Gospel of Luke. He also says he didn't just touch her. He said he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. So that's, he didn't just touch her. He spoke to it, and, 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 to, and not to her, but spoke to the fever, and instantly she is restored to full health. No recovery period. I mean, if you've ever had a fever for a day or two, I mean, usually after the heat fever breaks, it takes a day or two more until you get the feeling better, right? I mean, but not here, right? She goes from really, really, really sick to 100% well to uh, so much so that she gets up and begins to wait on Jesus and his disciples who are there at the house with her. And uh, so here's the quick takeaway from, from this. The application to us is that Jesus had to make her whole before she could serve him or anybody else, right? So that's a picture of what happens to us, right? That's always the way it is. We receive from Jesus before we can ever give to anybody else and, and effectively serve anybody else. We have to receive from him first. So he has authority over sickness. He also, starting in verse 40 of chapter 1, he has authority over disease. And so here we have a man with leprosy who came to him and begged him on his knees. Um, and so leprosy was not a temporary condition like maybe a fever would be. But this is an incurable condition. And the Jews really thought two things about lepers. Uh, you are basically, they saw you as the walking dead. And that you deserve this because God was mad at you. You have done something wrong and God has given you leprosy. And they got that from the Old Testament where there's several incidents in the Old Testament where God, somebody was off in sin or rebelling against God and he gave them leprosy. So they took that to the extreme and said everybody who had leprosy, this was God's judgment on them. And so the Jewish customs were that you don't even greet a leper. You don't talk to them. You don't look at them. You don't smile at them. You were to stay at least six feet away from them. This is the original social distancing, right? Remember that from a few years ago, right? <laughs> And if the wind was blowing, it was double, triple, or quadruple that. You just didn't get downwind from these people um, and, uh, it, or have any contact with them at all. And the only thing that was more, uh, more defiling than contact with a leper would be contact with a dead body. So this condition was contagious, and it was a debilitating skin disease, and it corrupted some of this victim little by little. And basically causing your extremities, your hands, your feet, your toes, your ears, your nose, to become numb. And often that numbness uh, it resulted in injuries to the affected areas. Then they wouldn't heal. The flesh would begin to rot. You would lose fingers, toes, feet, hands, nose, ears, all that kind of stuff. And so very much disfigured and deformed and made them essentially that walking dead. Therefore, society, especially religious people, scorned lepers. And there's even writings from, uh, from, from rabbis and stuff where we talk about throwing rocks at lepers to keep them away from them. So this is the, the mindset of this first century about this condition. So this guy was desperate, right? He's got nothing to lose here. Uh, and notice what he asked for. He doesn't just say, heal me. He says, make me clean. Okay? So uh, having leprosy not only meant that you had these physical issues, but it also meant complete isolation and separation from everybody else except other lepers. And um, so he wasn't allowed to interact with his family, in society, or with anybody else. And so um, not only did it cause physical problems, this disease, but it also separated you and isolated you and so did damage to you on the inside too. And so he's not just wanting physical healing. He wants restoration. He wants to be back with his family. He wants to be back in society. He wants to go to temple. You know, he wants to do all of these kind of things. And um, there hasn't, up until this point, there's been other healings, but there has never been a healing of leprosy. This is the first one re recorded in the Gospels. And so he, he had no evidence that Jesus would talk to him, would heal him. And, uh, uh, and from this terrible condition, so but he comes anyway. And so I love this part of the story, filled with compassion. This is the way Jesus responds to this man. And the word for compassion here in the original language meant a deep, visceral feeling in your gut. Not just sympathy or, 
or pity, not just like the, the, the sad puppy videos that, I mean, uh, commercials you see on TV where you go, oh, that's so sad, and then you go on with your life, and you don't think about it anymore. This was a deep aching for this man when he saw him. Jesus' heart was moved toward him. So in Jesus' day, sick people, like Peter's mother-in-law, uh, uh, might have elicited compassion from other people, and they might have gone to her, helped her out to care of her, but not for, not for lepers. They did not arouse compassion. Remember, they were hated, rejected, because they was, you know, it was a threatening disease to everybody if you caught it. And um, they also cared with this, well, it's your fault anyway. And if you hadn't done whatever you did, you wouldn't have this. So it was that kind of idea. So how does Jesus express compassion to him? He reached out and touched this man. And uh, that's significant because nobody touched lepers ever. Remember the social distancing thing? And so the word here is touched, is not just brushed, not just tapped on the head. The word here is to grip in order to manipulate or change. So he took hold of this man, and he wasn't afraid of getting sick. He was not afraid of the man's disease, and he, and he held on to him in order to convey his healing. Now, he could have stood back and just said, be clean, because we see that, that uh, done multiple times. You know, it's even at a long distance, he would just say, go home, your person is is healed and that happened so he didn't have to touch him but this was conveying to the man um, that he, he is he wanted to give him more than just healing he wanted to bring it into relationship with him he wanted to he, him to have an acceptance that he hadn't had in a long time and this by the way another little side here is what he does for all of us right our sin and uncleanness does not scare Jesus away it doesn't threaten him at all and when we come to him he embraces us and his healing power flows toward us to make us whole as well. So it's a picture of what he does for us as well as what he did here for this man. And Jesus said, be clean. Now, he's not talking to that man, right? Because how would the man follow those instructions? If I could be clean on my own, I'd do it, right? And so obviously, it wasn't a command to him. And so uh, what he is doing is just like he spoke to the fever here, He's speaking to this man's body, to this man's illness, and uh, uh, making him whole. And it reminds us that Jesus has the authority over everything right down to the cells in our body. Colossians chapter 1 says, in him all things hold together. And that goes down to the microscopic level. He is in a power, and he is in authority over all those things. So Jesus is in authority over the spirit world, Satan and demons, sin, over the physical world, sickness and disease. And the last thing I want to talk about tonight and end with is he also has rightful authority over our lives. Okay? And so here we have the story, the calling of the disciples, in, uh, starting in verse 16 of chapter 1. It says, Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once, that means a once and for all action there, they left their nets and followed him. When we had gone a little farther, further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, his brother John, in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, that's immediately there, he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in a boat with the hired men, and they followed him. And so that's a, a immediately. A, a, an immediate action, and um, the Greek speaks, like I said, once and for all, no questions asked, no answers offered. He called, and they came. Now, uh, writer, author William Lane talks about this passage right here, and he says, The stress in Mark's brief report here falls upon the sovereign authority in Jesus' call and the radical obedience of Simon, Peter, James, and John. So compelling is the claim of Jesus upon them that all prior claims lose their validity. The father, the hired servant, the family business with the boat, the nets are left behind as they commit themselves in exclusive sense to follow Jesus. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you, just, you just think about that, right? Did anybody have a drop everything moment? I mean, just a walk away from everything moment? Uh, I uh, grew up in um, North Carolina, a little bitty town, Lexington, North Carolina, about 12 to 15,000 people. I was a small town girl, wanted to be a small town girl my whole life, had no 
a plan to ever move away anywhere else and, and I was just to live there my whole life, but um, I worked in uh, television broadcasting uh, for five years up there. And um, I, after those five years, I realized I need some more experience if I ever wanted to progress in the, the industry. So I applied for a, a, a job at CNN here in Atlanta and then had a phone interview in two weeks that show up in Atlanta um, and you can go to work here. <laughs> and that was like, you know, everything that I had known, I left behind. My mom, my dad, my family, every, you know, I went to kindergarten and graduated with the same people when I graduated from high school. You know, it was just like that. And I decided I was going to take the job, and I loaded up a U-Haul and, and my dog <laughs> and drove to Atlanta. And here I was in this big city. I didn't know where the grocery store was. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I call, I, I, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't know how to get to CNN. I called up them. I'm like, tell me how to get there. And they're like, do you know where 85 is? Drive straight. <laughs> you know, that's it. And that was as close to a, uh, a drop everything moment as I can think. You know, when I tell this story to people, I describe it like this: It's like if somebody grabbed a plant from over here and they ripped it up by the roots and they moved it up and they set it down like that. That's what it felt like. I felt like I just left everything behind. But even that is not what these guys did because in their culture, you did not leave your family. If you were born into a fishing family, you died in the fishing family and all your kids were fishermen. That's just the way it was. You didn't leave your family and move somewhere else. Our, our culture is so transient that it's like, oh, you're from Atlanta? There's like three people who were born and grew up in Atlanta, right? Everybody else moved here. And, but that's not the way it was back then. But these guys, in the middle of the day, with no two-week notice, with no uh, you know, thinking through it, with no going home, no talking with their wives about it, no wrapping up the loose ends, no explanation or anything, they walked away. And it was a huge thing that they did. And what made them do that? It was the realization of who Jesus was. That's Mark's whole point here. Christian, uh, if you know Philip Yancey, he is a, a, a writer too. And he says in one of his books, he said that he's felt like he's been lied to by the old Jesus films from years ago. Not so much like The Chosen now, uh, but back years ago uh, where they have Jesus pictured with a soft po focus around his face. And he's reciting his lines with no emotion, moving through things, you know, with just ethereal look on his face. One of the pastors I like to listen to, he says he's got lots of product in his hair, too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's just otherworldly kind of thing, and you know, separated and distant from everybody around him. And Philip Yancey calls this the image of Jesus, the Prozac Jesus. <laughs> I think it's really funny. And he said, that's a really bad picture of what the Gospels tells us. That's not what Jesus is like. And he said, by contrast to that picture... Philip Yancey says the Gospels present a man who has such charisma that people will sit three days straight without food just to hear his riveting words. Mm. I mean, that's what we see, right? And it's like this is also what Paul echoes in the New Testament. He says, I consider everything lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that's garbage, that I may gain Christ. This is the picture that Paul gives us. And in this chapter of, of Mark, that's what we see. We're seeing people so moved uh, by him that they risk everything to get near him. They even tear a roof off a house because they think they know the power of Jesus, right? And when we're confronted with the real Christ as he really is, we find him just that compelling, too. And yet today in the church, we often act like it takes every last ounce of our will uh, to, to pull ourselves away from what we want to do to follow after him. And if we do decide we're going to leave our nets behind, we might follow him around the block for a little bit, but then we're back to our boats, jumping back and grabbing up our old stuff, or we're constantly thinking about the life we left behind, right? And possibly one one of the reasons that we fail to, 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 and we yield to temptation over and over again is because we have in our mind this Prozac Jesus who really doesn't care what I do. And if 
I do do something that he doesn't like, he's going to forgive me anyway, and it's not that big a deal. So maybe I'll read my Bible, but let me check my Facebook, my social media, and watch a few videos first. Maybe I'll go to church if, I, if I'm not too tired. Maybe I'll call that person to encourage them after I finish what I want to do. And maybe I'll, I'll all this stuff about holiness and righteousness and sin. Eh, Jesus doesn't really care that much about that, does he? No, that is not the case. And that is not the picture we have presented for us in the Gospel of Mark right here. In his grace, sometimes God does let us get away with doing our own thing for a while, right? But when we really understand who Jesus is and the authority that he has and understand that demons beg him not to hurt them and to, they recoil from him and that Satan is defeated easily, that sin is broken in his presence, that disease and sickness melt under his touch and under his word, Goodness gracious, wow, right? Wow, is that a different picture that we have? What, uh, what are we doing when we resist or we're distracted uh, for, by such trivial things today or hesitate and following through when he tells us to do something or, or gives us a clear command? Do we really know who Jesus is at all? Are we paying attention to what the Gospels and what the New Testament tells us about him? Remember that Jesus has the power and the right to zap your brain and force you to serve him as his own personal slave. Our king has every right and all the power necessary to put us in chains and force us to obey, or worse, say, I'm tired of you, and cast us from his presence and say, go away from me, you sinful person. That's not what he says. Even though he has all those rights and perfect perfect knowledge and ability to do that, rather than crushing us, he calls out to us gently. Follow me, he says. Come and follow me. And then he waits for us to obey with all our heart, free, with gratitude, cheerfully, as though we have no other desire than to, li than to live for him. Disciples encountered Jesus. They had seen, they had heard they knew this is no ordinary man here. They knew he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and following him was worth the sacrifice. It wasn't even an equal trade. The scales are way over to the other side toward following Jesus. Like Paul said, everything, everything that you have is rubbish compared to knowing him. They knew it was the better deal. And they'd seen for themselves and they knew it to be true. Do we not know as well? Can we not see? Have we not heard? So what is the thing that keeps you from diving out of the boat, casting aside the nets, whatever those nets are, and running to him to say whatever you say? One more verse to wrap this up, and then we'll go to our groups. This is a familiar one, Romans 12, 1. This is Paul speaking. He said, I urge you, brothers, as Christians, live in view of God's mercy. Now, what does it mean to be in view of something? And generally, it speaks that we have not, that we have to consider something, but literally, to have to be in view of something means that you've seen it, right? Like, if I'm in view of the Statue of Liberty, right there it is. I can see it with my eyes. So Paul says, in view of God's mercy, since you have seen God's mercy, since your eyes have beheld, since you know firsthand about God's mercy, he goes on to say what? Offer. Offer. That is, you're not under compulsion. Do it voluntarily. Be intentional about it. Offer it. Your, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Okay? Back in Mark, Jesus looked at those guys and said, follow me. Because they knew the reality of who was making the invitation. They dropped everything and followed him. Not knowing where they're going, not knowing what was ahead of them, or how their lives would end. If we look at history, we know that all the disciples, except John, were martyred for their faith. And John, lived, even though he lived into his 90s, it was not cushy 90s in a retirement community. He was tortured. He was banished. It was really hard on, on John. And he was so he was he was tortured and um, 
he gave up for his faith as well. Follow me, Jesus said to these guys. You know this verse is the same command? It's the same command. You also know. You've seen. You've had personal interaction. If you call yourself a Christian, you've had personal interaction, and you know the mercy of God through Jesus. He says, offer it all back to him. Without knowing what that means. Or where you're going, what happens, how your life will end, what difficulty lays in front of you, do it anyway. Come. Follow. Voluntarily, because you've seen. Because you've heard. Because you know. Right? The truth is, when we look at it objectively, not even a comparison. Not even a comparison. Remember, Paul, I count it rubbish, garbage in comparison to knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. View of God's mercy. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. He invites us to come to life at its best. We ought to be quick to drop our nets, scramble out of the boat, never look back, follow him wherever he leads. Amen? Amen. God, we thank you that you're gentle and kind and loving and patient, but that you continually offer us the option to follow you. You're not going to force us to do it, but in your grace and mercy, you let us come and follow you. God, thank you so much for that. Thank you for the opportunity. God, let us not miss that opportunity to know you as our Lord and not be distracted by such trivial things that are around us every day. God, give us focus. Help us to, to understand and to remember who you really are. And that is the mighty Son of God. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.